Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Talking Politics. Today, we have our senior editor, Libby Emmons, who is our sort of uh, token American at the company. Uh, she's written pretty much everywhere and is just a sort of wonderful person to work with. So thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thanks, Nico. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure. So what's going on in the US at the moment? It's just obviously being in Canada and being from Britain, I look at the racial tension and just the, the real emotion that is being expressed uh, pretty tangibly, I would say, on the streets of America. And how has it gotten to this point? And I know that's quite a broad question, but I'm going to see if you can answer it. Yeah, well, I mean, to really figure out how it got to this point, you would really have to go back to the origins of slavery in the United States, um, track that all the way through the Civil War, up through Reconstruction, um, and, you know, straight through to the Civil Rights Movement, figure out what's going on there, and then continue on through the 20th century with the um, L.A. riots. And then in 92, I believe, we had Rodney King in L.A., and, uh, you know, we've continued on this path of racial tension for quite a long time. Recently, of course, we have on May 25th, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis at the hands of police officers. And what I think is so interesting uh, about this case, finally, is that it is undisputed that this was a murder of a man at the hands of police officers. We have video, everyone has looked at it, and it is just so clear. And I think this is the first time that we've had um, unequivocal agreement as to the fact that this was a police murder of a black man. There have been so many cases where, um, even going back to Emmett Till, who was lynched, um, you know, and that was such a horrifying story, and we have so many horrifying stories, and a lot of them have been disputed. You have district attorneys who refuse to prosecute in a lot of cases. I believe that's what happened in the Eric Garner case, which was here in New York in Staten Island. Um, I think that was 2015, although I could be incorrect. Um, but this is unequivocal. There is no doubt that this was a brutal police killing. We have the president, you know, say what you will about him um, saying that this was a bad killing. You have mm. the governors, you have um, really militant police advocates like Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York, um, and Bernie Carrick, who was former police commissioner of New York, saying that this was a terrible act. So that is, that is new for this conversation. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because we've had protests before. Um, there were protests around Eric Garner, uh, Tamir Rice, um, Michael Brown, you know, launched the, his death, launched the um, Ferguson riots a few years ago that spread out around that area. And we had, we had, um, that wasn't riots. Those were protests. Were they riots? Were they riots? I don't remember. <laughs> I'm um, <laughs> but I know in New York, those were protests. Those were not riots. Um, what I think makes this time period so different is that we have three months of coronavirus lockdown that has disemployed over 40 million Americans, um, shuttered businesses, shuttered schools, shuttered churches, um, playgrounds are blocked off, um, bars are closed, restaurants, anything that you can do in the U.S. in most major metropolitan cities, you are no longer allowed to do. Um, Aside from and then the we, it seems. Right. And then we have this man killed, which releases a um, very justified wave of protests in, you know, to, to protest police brutality and, um, you know, racism, et cetera. But I think what makes it so different is that there's nowhere for people to go. So 
you can't leave your house to go get your haircut. You can't leave your house to go to church, to go to work, to go to school, to do anything else. But you can leave your house to protest. And unlike, um, I was in Manhattan the day before um, Mr. Floyd was killed and there was a feeling of hopefulness in the air. I took the ferry with my son. It was lovely. We had a picnic in the park um, and people were out. Lots of people were doing things and um, Manhattan was starting to feel like it was going to be Manhattan again. And it was actually a pretty exciting feeling. And then the next day, you know, all hell breaks loose. Um, well, the day after, I guess, but, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, and I don't think that's when the protest started in New York. I think it was a little later. Was it Thursday or Friday? And again, because it's the coronavirus lockdown, there's still no tomorrow. Every day is pretty much the same as today. It's just this endless today. So while it's very clear when Mr. Floyd was killed, anything after that, the, the protests continue every single day. No one has to go to work. Um, so I think that's why we're in a situation where it is a constant and new, n new um, ongoing situation. Yeah. And you, Does that you, make sense? You, yeah, it does. And you've been very interesting about this. And you, you wrote a fantastic article the other day about um, just how this is a perfect storm. You have this mass unemployment combined with just everyone spending the last three months indoors, combined mm -hmm. on top of that with a pandemic, and then you have this racial tension. And it seems right. like I, I don't understand where this is going to go, what's going to happen. Because it, it's just, is it going to calm down at all in the foreseeable future? I don't know. I think it's interesting today. We had um, the DA, I think, in Minneapolis last Thursday brought charges against one of the officers. And yeah. those charges were, what was it, second degree murder and manslaughter, maybe? Yeah, or so. was it third degree murder and manslaughter? I, I believe it's, uh, it's now second degree murder as of a few hours ago. Yeah, and then they changed it today. They yeah. also have brought charges against the other officers, I think. Yes. Um, and I think that uh, that's not going to have an impact no. on the protests. I don't know why it would, because those, um, I know that those were part of the demands of the NAACP, were that these um, officers would also be charged. But I don't, I don't know that it's really going to make a difference with the ask to dismantle the, um, you know, systemic racism of the American power structure well, or what have you. Unachievable when you phrase it like that, isn't it? So you, you well, get sort of everyone yes. saying, "Oh, we won't stop until it's dismantled." But what exactly does that mean? You know, what what what, what do you right. want to achieve? If, if racism is inherent in every single aspect of American culture and it and society and the economy and the political structure and it needs to be dismantled in order to move forward, then the only thing to do is to burn everything down. For a couple of years now, we've had um, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her squad saying things like, we need to burn it down, we need a revolution. Today have, I think, Nancy Pelosi is out protesting. We've seen Kamala Harris out protesting. These are extremely high power. I mean, Nancy Pelosi is the, the Speaker of the House. Um, Kamala Harris is a very high powered senator who ran for the Democratic presidential nomination this year. Yeah. What are they, you know, I brought this up on Twitter and I was immediately knocked down for suggesting it, but I'm saying like, they're, these leaders, these elected officials, they're protesting themselves. Um, it was, I think, in 2015, after Eric Garner was killed, that Hakeem Jeffries brought a bill to the House of Representatives to um, illegalize, make illegal chokeholds and other police practices, and to offer federal reform for um, you know police across the country. They didn't take it up then in 2015. Now it's being touted by Joe Biden, who, of course, is the going to be the Democratic nominee for president. Uh, if they really cared about this so much, why didn't they get that legislation passed? It's been sitting there. 
yeah. for five years. You know, we've had more of this in that period of time for sure. So, you know, where have you been and why are you choosing to protest yourself now? Why not take up the pen of legislation and get something done if that's how you feel about it? But I, yeah, I do think that a lot of this, and again, people are, that I've talked to about this who are um, much more advocating for these protests to continue are saying, no, it doesn't have anything to do with coronavirus. But I think that obviously it does, because typically in New York, we have a lot of large social gatherings. We have a lot of protests. You know, I've, I've been to some of them. I marched in a anti-war protest years ago uh, against George Bush. Mm. Um, and we shut down Second Avenue. We shut down the 59th Street Bridge. Um, and these were pretty severe actions, shutting down transit. Uh, ambulances can't get through, et cetera. You know, that was a pretty big deal. We were saying, like, let's not have a war. Um, but the next day, the, the police cleared the area. Some people hung out in Times Square. The police brought in the horses, and it's actually kind of scary to be protesting when the police bring in the horses, um, because there's like five police on horses, and they're really big and (laughs) scary. Uh, But so then we we went home. I think we went, we got some drinks, and the next day I went to work. Yeah. In this case, you can't go get drinks. You can't go, you know, revel in your civil action with your friends at the local watering hole of which we have so many spectacular ones and you can't wake up and go to work the next day and reflect and think about it and talk about it it's just an ongoing situation so I think the real failure here is a failure of leadership in the city I think Bill de Blasio has no idea what he's doing and he's just wandering around saying everything's going to be cool. He was so insistent that we get federal aid for coronavirus stuff. Where's our ventilators? Where's our testing? Where's our field hospital? Where's our giant ship, you yeah. know, to like take care of people? And now he's just like, no, we don't need your help for this. We don't need your help for these people who are breaking into Macy's. Um, very I'm, iconic it, shop. Harold it seems to me that America has sort of an existential crisis every two decades or so, and it's always present, and it's most visible through the polarization that exists in America. But I see it seeping into Canada as well, and just other democratic nations across the Western world. And I, I think as a result of that, it's difficult to say that, look, yeah, I, I think these protests are justified. I think that that cop clearly murdered Mr. Floyd. However, the looting and the violence is totally unacceptable. But that, in America, puts you on the side of a pretty nasty group of people, I would suggest. But then you're a white supremacist for suggesting yeah. something like that. And it's forced these Democrat governors and mayors to even condone this yeah. outright violence, right, in the name of racial equality, in fear that they may be called a racist. And I think that also may be contributing to this. And all the points that she just mentioned, on top of just totally wet leadership, I think will make this a really difficult summer for the States and Canada as well, for that matter. I I, I just really don't see it. I think so too. I don't see, yeah, I don't see a very easy way out of this because when you have one side saying, you know, the entire system is wrong, so get rid of it. And the other side is saying, you're right about a couple of points, but we'd really lo- not like to burn down our entire society. You know, yeah. that's, a, that's a hard spot. And additionally, the problem that we have is that the coronavirus lockdown that, you know, disemployed so many people and shuttered so many businesses, the expense of that is going to, is, was already going to be monstrous. Now the expense of this, of cleaning up major metropolitan cities in all 50 states is also going to be incredibly expensive. So a lot of businesses aren't going to come back. Um, And the question becomes, where are we going to get the money to fix all of these things, to rebuild our 
you know, infrastructure to get people jobs? And what is going to fall by the wayside? Are we going to have, we had a lot of um, social strife in New York City in the 70s. It Mm. took the 80s to get to the 90s. The transition of power between the 80s and Giuliani's 90s was very difficult and weird and hard for artists. But we also had a lot of art flourishing here in the 80s. A couple things were terrible, though. The subways were scary. People were getting mugged a lot. Um, you know, people were putting signs in their cars that said no radio. So that in hopes that people wouldn't break into their cars, uh, and the educational system was a total disaster. So I'm raising my son in New York city. I've been comfortable here. It's, you know, for the last like 10 years, New York has practically been Disneyland. Um, you know, I've been here for much longer than that. And I'm concerned about funding being pulled from the educational system in this city in order to fund other things. If we have that situation, we're going to have a lot of the, you know, educated people who moved back into the city, black, white, Latino, whatever, you know, leaving the city because they can afford to. Um, You know, we have a professional class that is very diverse in the city. Why would they stay if they don't have to, if they can work from home? and go move to a place where there's better schools, that tax base is going to disappear. You know, we could see property values decline, which would be a disaster for the city. We could see major headquarters leaving the city. I think Citibank has already gone somewhere else, whether it's temporarily or not. Um, Could be wrong about Citibank. I know some, one of the banks did, but then what happens what happens to this beautiful place? What happens to the education of all of these children who are out in the streets, you know, demanding their rights? Like what about education? I'm just not sure. So yeah, I think it's a concern. I think whenever we stop this mess, it's going to be 10 years of pretty serious rebuilding and difficulty. Um, It would be great to start on that sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, but what's more tangibly, what's going to happen in November? Do you think, because if you look back in literally a few months ago, sort of pre-pandemic America, it looked as though Trump would just storm the White House and that he'd roll over Joe Biden. Is that still going to happen? Or do you think this, just, this chaos has made a Trump presidency or a, a second term more unlikely? Right up until election day in 2016, I thought, um, I thought uh, Hillary Clinton had a chance. And then as soon as the results started rolling in and I was watching it on TV, I was like, oh, no, we are, you know, we are, we're screwed here. Um, I have no idea what's going to happen. I would have said during coronavirus when all we saw was Joe Biden talking to us from his basement about like, Hey, we've got to ramp up testing. (laughs) It's like, okay. You know, I I would have said that he doesn't have a chance because the story was the virus and nobody was caring about the election. For example, um, yesterday was a huge day of primaries. It was enormous. There, I don't think we ran a story on it. No, we didn't. Because there was just, it just didn't, did not make news. The primaries did not make news. This should have been a big story. Um, it wasn't. So, yeah, I I don't know. I think Trump looks pretty bad right now. Uh, I also don't think Biden looks great. I think both of these men still represent an absence of any real kind of leadership in this country. And I think that that's devastating. Um, it would be great if we had somebody good to vote for. The other side of that is, of course, that your national leaders, I think we put too much, um, I wouldn't say faith, because we don't think we put any real faith in our national leaders, but we put too much emphasis on their importance. Yeah. I don't think national leaders are as important. I think governors, as it turns out, are more important. A lot of governors could be really making their political careers right now. Yeah. And taking a stand. Um, that would be nice to see. That would definitely be some new blood at the national level, which we are sorely in need of. And uh, I also think, what's his name from CNN is planning to run for governor of New York? Oh, God. It's um, not uh, 
sort of Frey no. news of whatever his nickname is. No, God, maybe I'm wrong. But I, there was some media executive who's planning to, I think, run for governor of New York. And I think that's a terrible idea. We cannot give leadership to media. Yeah. Media is there to comment on what's going on, not there to like make what's going on. Um, yeah. At least ideally not. No, it, yeah. it, it's true. I think we have trash leadership. We need better lead. We need something new. But it seems to be. It, but we always say that. That's what we always say. We say yeah. that every time. You, you haven't had particularly good leaders, uh, I would say, since Bill Clinton. It's just been sort of disaster after disaster. It's been not great. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, if you look at Bill Clinton <laughs> in retrospect, <laughs> you know, he would have been destroyed for all that stuff. He never would have made it to governor. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. The thing about Joe Biden, though, is I think it's a pretty mm -hmm. safe choice because he's so senile that you know he's mm -hmm. not going to be running the show. So instead, it's going to be these sort of ex-Obama Democratic apparatchiks who are just mm -hmm. total technocrats and, and hide in the public shadow making all the important decisions. And if you just let the sort of technocrats hold it for four years until we get proper leadership again, I, I think that may, <laughs> may be too cynical. That sounds horrid. <laughs> really pretty terrible yeah. you know it's funny i protested george bush so many times and now i'm kind of like hmm, that wouldn't be the worst he wouldn't be the worst he would not be worse than trump yeah i, I don't think anyone has done better than george bush with the uh, trump presidency no he looks way better i mean at the time we thought he was such a stupid little idiot playboy and now we're like oh no this guy this is the stupid idiot playboy, yeah. you know? I mean, he's not even a real president. He's like the marketer in chief. He's all about branding. Yeah. He just switches from thing to thing. It's so, it's so weird and terrifying to watch. I think we should, um, yeah, start looking at to the governors and their executive leadership. Right. Um, you know, this is his first elected office and he really should never have even been hall monitor. <laughs> yeah, I think you might be right. <laughs> Livy, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Talk to you yeah. later. Bye bye. bye.